Um, okay. I wanted to start simply by uh, letting people know where we're talking about. Uh, and that this is a map of the Sela area. Um, it's roughly in the area of the gateway cities, if anybody uh, is familiar with the geography there. Uh, I've listed all of our partners. Um, we have lots of them. Um, you heard about uh, USC, UC Davis. Um, we were affiliated with the Pat Brown Institute at Cal State Law, LA uh, and many public agencies. The study area itself, um, it's not that large, 62 square miles, but it has a population of 750,000 people. Uh, that means it's one of the densest uh, areas in uh, California uh, with about 12,000 people per square mile. Uh, it includes 11 cities plus unincorporated areas. It is overwhelmingly Hispanic, um, about 85% on average. Um, and um, Spanish as the uh, first language is common in most households. Uh, it is part of two uh, AB 617 areas, one in the south, one in the north. Um, it is traversed by several freeways. It's the home of the Alameda Rail Corridor. Uh, it is just north of the ports and on the south side and the intermodal rail yards to the north. So it is definitely an area that gets a lot of goods movement impact. Um, our partner, as I said, was the Sela Collaborative. Um, uh, it's our ma major partner. Um, they participated in all aspects of the research. Uh, they conducted our focus groups. Um, and we met monthly, so they were actually one of the research partners. In addition, we had a project advisory committee, which was a larger group. Um, and as I mentioned, um, we used focus groups as a way to launch it, the research. Um, in terms of the freight analysis, you're gonna hear two pieces. Um, first, you're gonna hear from Miguel um, Yaller, who did the regional analysis, which is on the left. Uh, and then you'll hear from me and my team, uh, which is the local analysis on the right. And at least, I think this gives you some idea of the complexity of um, if we're gonna solve goods movement problems at all the levels that we really have to look at. Uh, and you'll see that we kind of um, sandwiched our research between focus groups um, so that we started out by hearing from what people were concerned about uh, we had a lot of interaction informally uh, in these areas. And then when we had our findings, we went back again to the community, ran through all of these again, and that's how we ended up with our recommendations. Um, very quickly, uh, as I said, this is an area that is really impacted by freight traffic and much of it is through traffic. So a little bit over half of all of the freight, meaning heavy duty truck traffic, that runs through this area is through traffic. Uh, and this graphic just gives you um, the um, traffic by origin. So um, we get more traffic, of course, that's through traffic um, in these areas here. Um, uh, roughly, I'm gonna just move quickly here. Um, there's huge amounts of freight volume um, in the area. Uh, I have two graphics here. One is with the freeways. This one is without the freeways. Uh, but you can see what we calculated was trucks per day per square mile. Um, and you can see that um, in no matter how we measure, um, the Sela area has a very disproportionate share of truck traffic compared to the county as a whole. I'm gonna turn this over to Miguel Yaller now, um, who will talk about the regional analysis. Thank you, Ian. Uh, thanks everyone. So we conducted analysis using and leveraging um, traffic simulation from the uh, SCAG model. And what we can see here is that the BMT related to heavy duty traffic, even though it's small compared to the total traffic in the, in the region, generates a disproportionate amount of the externalities. You can see NOx and PM can be between 50 and 80% of all the PM and NOx that is generated in the, in the region. And the contribution to CO2 could be up to 30% uh, 
when we move up to 2040. So we analyze a few strategies on how to mitigate that based on existing regulations and the regulation that were still being discussed uh, in the state when we were doing uh, the project or this quantitative part of the project. So what you see in the, on the left uh, will be the estimates of the emissions related to the heavy duty traffic, including medium heavy duty um, between 2020 and 2040. As we can see there, based on the pre-advanced uh, clean truck rule and the ongoing discussions on the ACF, uh, the existing regulations, if they achieved the objectives, were able to reduce or significantly reduce some of those emissions and impacts. What we did on the right side is we estimated and also leveraging uh, work that was done at the, at the Institute and our partners as part of the decarbonization scenarios for California. Uh, we also implemented what will be uh, the potential reduction in the state. And we see further reductions in CO2 and, and SOX uh, that were kind of uh, lagging in the pre-ACT analysis. So this was based on mainly the penetration of zero emission vehicles, uh, looking at the turnover of the fleet and the sales mandate. We also look into the next slide. We also look into strategies that were more uh, at the operational level. Um, yeah, can you... Did I skip one? No. The next one. Do you want? Yeah, so here, in addition to the penetration of zero emission vehicles, we also analyze operational strategies that include in this case, geofencing, the similar reason we wanted to do is we do a particular emphasis and try to mitigate uh, truck traffic impact on the seller. What happens if we enforce some sort of pricing? And the pricing can be done either by mile, by time, or by particular emissions. And what we see here is that based on the analysis and model that we generated, we can achieve significant reductions inside the seller region uh, especially or particularly for uh, diesel trucks that will be still uh, traveling in the region uh, up to 30 percent let's say without having a generalized impact throughout the region so we are just not uh, moving the problem out of the cellar to the rest or to another community we can achieve these specific benefits without having that disproportionate impact elsewhere so finally, after doing uh, the genital and the regional analysis, we came to some uh, conclusions and, and major findings. So by 2040, uh, truck traffic expected to grow by 50% and existing regulations and regulations now, ACP and others, will be able to help reduce those emissions if we are able to create the mechanisms and continue to provide the incentives to, for that penetration of zero emission vehicles, the infrastructure that is needed to accommodate those vehicles in the system. We can achieve a continuous reduction on CO2, uh, PM, and other species. But again, we need incentives, monetary and non monetary incentives. We need to foster and work with fleets, work with uh, facilities to be able to accommodate infrastructure. And we, will, in the short term, we're still going to need to uh, make changes to accommodate technical challenges on some of these. Uh, new technologies. However, electrification or other type of zero emission technologies will not be able to solve all the problems that we found or that the overall team found in the region related to safety and non-emission externalities. Thank you, Miguel. Sorry, this is Julia Caltrans. Can I just ask one question real quick? Apologies for the interruption. Okay. Um, sure. You, you you said you had a 2012 baseline, is that right? Yeah, we were using the calibrated uh, R, R speed uh, for SCAG. That was based on 2020. Uh, gotcha. 2012, okay, that's my only question was, yeah, how, how did you um, set on that date? Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, then we're gonna quickly come to um, the local analysis. So we did that regional analysis. Now we, uh, we scaled down to what's really happening in Sela. Um, and our first focus group was quite a surprise uh, because what we did in the focus group was show pictures like this one that you see um, and asked, you know, what, what is it that comes to mind when you see this? And this is, you know, a bunch of trucks. Um, 
the, the words on the right are what we heard, um, that the discussion was overwhelmingly about safety and risk. Uh, people told stories about um, the experiences that they had had um, and what they do to avoid trucks, why they are um, afraid of trucks and so on. And, and this actually told us that we had to restructure our research uh, because we were expecting people to say diesel emissions um, and all of the health impacts that that uh, that go along with that. And while they acknowledged, yes, you know, there's a terrible asthma problem in the, in the area and so on, uh, they were much more um, focused on the safety threats that they saw uh, being overwhelmed by trucks. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Sue uh, to talk about our left turn. Um, and I just thought we should share this, even though, you know, we're talking about climate change here. Um, as, uh, as some of the things that you do if you are gonna do community engaged research. So Sue, do you wanna just go through this slide? Surely, thank you. Uh, good morning. Um, so we actually, to address the concerns of the community, we looked at um, crash analysis that is actually uh, uh, the California Highway Patrol tracks crashes, both on highway and non-highway spaces. And um, this particular uh, data is consolidated in a, a system called the Transportation Injury Mapping System, or TIMS. So we utilized four years of data and extracted all of the crashes that were class seven or higher trucks. And this includes any kind of interactions that would be between truck, 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 car, truck, um, uh, pedestrian, any kind of, of accident that is recorded. And so this is for, uh, you can see here in the left-hand side, the city of Los Angeles, Los Angeles County, and the cell area. The total truck crashes, which were both on the highway and non-highway in this time period were 743. And, but you can see here that something that was pretty shocking to us is that the fatalities per crash was at a much higher rate than the other areas. So this did, you know, directly correlate to the information that we were being told that the, you know, the accidents were were, were scary to the people and they were they were actually seeing this. Um, so on the right hand side, you can see the primary collision factors for these crashes. And this is for non-highway. Um, there's a little bit of a different, but they tend to have uh, similar type of characteristics for the highway, but um, unsafe speed was the number one, um, followed by uh, automobile, automobile right away and improper turning. So um, these things really shed some light on, uh, on what was being told to us uh, through this data collection. Can you go to the next slide? So we, we did focus on the non-highway uh, related incidents because uh, a lot of the highway traffic also is through traffic. But you can see here that um, this it's a busy it's a busy map, but it tells a whole lot of information because you can see the stars are fatal or severe crashes. So these are these are the really scary ones and the ones that have the most impact on the community. But you do see a lot of blue dots where pedestrians are involved. So um, and we could also see where there were multiple crashes at the same location. So those multiple crash locations really gave us the opportunity to zoom in and look. We actually went to sites. We did a, a on the ground observation of those areas to see what was going on. Uh, and so we, we actually did a seven, seven step tiered process uh, to look at that, which was on the previous slide. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Sue. I'm looking at my uh, stopwatch and we are about out of time. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'm sorry. I'll, I can go quick. Um, so from that hotspot analysis, uh, we went and decided on two different locations for case studies. And the first being along Alameda Street, which is where the Alameda corridor is. Um, and that showed a higher propensity of pedestrian related crashes. And the, the intersections along the corridor are very um, complicated because of the, the Alameda corridor in the middle of it. 
And so we are doing modeling using VISIM, a micro simulation model for Alameda in looking at how we can change traffic operations at both intersections and along the corridor um, to make the situation safer while still keeping freight and vehicle operations uh, where they're at today. Thank you, Robert. I'm gonna skip because as I said, our time is up. So I just wanna to get to this very quickly. Uh, this is our, our uh, recommendations from the collection of, of both UC Davis, Miguel's work and our work. Um, and this very quickly, clearly we need support and funding uh, if we're going to achieve our targets for zero emission vehicles and so on. Um, we know that um, some of the local problems can be mitigated if we accelerate the transition to zero or near zero trucks traveling in the area. Um, we would suggest that areas like Sela, there's plenty of them around the state, should be the priority areas for infrastructure, low emission zones, demonstration projects, anything we can do to kind of um, accelerate the process. Um, we are working with our Sela um, colleagues um, to encourage them to partner with local governments on the traffic safety side, because most of these streets are local streets. Uh, and then finally, we think that geofencing is really worth looking at in a selected way uh, to reduce some of the problems in residential areas. So those are our, um, uh, our conclusions. We were asked also to talk about future research um, we are working with uh, an, a big consortium that's led by the LA Clean Tech Incubator um, that's looking at using zero emission um, zones, curbside management to incentivize the use of zero emission vehicles. Uh, the first is in Santa Monica. This one is, uh, has already started. Um, but the plan is to be able to do these demonstrations in various areas, including um, AB 617 areas. So with that, I'll stop. Thank you very much. Jen, we have one quick question. Can you define geofencing for the audience? Oh, sure. Uh, geofencing, you'll hear a lot more about uh, from Matt in a minute, uh, but essentially it's a way of using technology to um, prevent a vehicle uh, from going in certain places. So it would be um, you know, it could be as radical as you turn the vehicle off, which of course you wouldn't want to do, uh, but there would be some alarm or something else that would signal to the driver uh, that you would not be, you are not allowed to use that road or use that route. So it depends on technology, of course. Thank you. All right. Um, we will be able to come back and refer back to these slides in the Q&A portion at the end of the meeting. But for now, we're going to go ahead and have uh, Matt, if you're ready to share your slides. Sure. No, happy to, to continue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share and hopefully everyone can see it and, and uh, hear me OK. All right. So very similar to what Jen and her team did, we, we looked at goods movement mainly focused on inland Southern California, so the Inland Empire. And uh, this was done with a number of different partners uh, as well. And so um, I'm, I'm, of course, from uh, CSERT, uh, where we do all sorts of research in new vehicle technology and new transportation strategies. And then we partnered up with one of our other sister centers here at UC Riverside, the Center for Social Innovation, and uh, led by uh, uh, Professor Karthik Ramakrishnan. And I think Karthik's on the line, and I also think Kanuk Bori Bunsumsen, one of our uh, other researchers from CSERT, is on the line as well. But this, is, uh, this was a project where we involved a number of different students. You can see some of the names there on the bottom. Uh, Ayla just recently graduated. She now works for CARB. And then we have a few postdocs uh, and other researchers that were involved in this project. Um, I, I should say we also had uh, uh, colleagues from UCLA and also UC Irvine that helped us out with this particular project. All right. Um, so, um, you know, just, just very similar where, you know, if you look at uh, what's going on in inland Southern California, just like certain parts of Los Angeles, we're seeing obviously an increase in truck traffic. 
Uh, for us, there's a lot more emphasis on warehouses. And so we have this huge explosion of warehouses going up all over the place here in inland Southern California. And of course, along with that comes the truck traffic uh, moving goods, uh, not only from the ports to these warehouses, but then there's a lot of uh, activity between the warehouses. And then once they're sort of reorganized, they're going off to, to other directions. The other thing that we're going to talk about in just a moment is that there's an air cargo part of this too. And uh, you'll see in the region that the uh, have the uh, the San Bernardino Airport that has been designated as a major air cargo hub, um, and so uh, you know trucks. Of course, we we suffer from uh, the uh, air quality issues, and that is a, a major problem here in Southern in, in, in California. Uh, but just like Jen said, we found out by talking to the community that uh, it's not just all about air quality. There's a safety issue. Um, in a lot of the listening sessions that we've had, it was also about noise and, and time of day issues and things like that. So we'll, we'll get into those details in, in just a moment. So, uh, you know, very similarly to what Jen said, right off the bat, we engaged some of our local partners, some of those that you see here, and had that initial listening session about, hey, you know, what, what are the topics? What, what are the uh, major problems that are going on in inland Southern California? And uh, there, of course, are pockets of different things going on in terms of they don't like this warehouse at this particular location. So there's really these pockets of uh, complaints or concern of, of the local residents. Um, and we were more or less looking, should we look at this as a large region? But we felt it was a lot better to focus in on some very specific uh, activities, what people are moving forward with. And probably the, the biggest one uh, at the time, and it still is of concern, is again, uh, the transition of this new air cargo hub at San, San Bernardino Airport, where we're seeing the warehouses kind of coming in around that and the truck traffic going way up directly in the city of San, San Bernardino. So uh, we, we have the two parts, right? So we have the parts where we had the community interaction that helped guide us in terms of what is the problem? Where is it happening? What are some potential ways we can deal with it? And then we looked at what a lot of the research that we were already working on in terms of truck electrification. Uh, how do we deal with things like, you know, how do we get the infrastructure set up so that if we make, as we make this transition to electrification, how do we make it work? And this is not a trivial issue when it comes to heavy duty fleets. Um, we also do research in figuring out how we can add uh, tools such like connectivity and automation. And when, when we say automation with trucks, people immediately think of platooning where you have driverless trucks and all that. But, but automation is, is much more than that, right? There's partial automation that can be put into these vehicles that can really help uh, assist the drivers in terms of you know, not only making it safe, but uh, improving how they move around through the community uh, and, and giving them additional information on traffic signals and things like that. So we wanted to employ those uh, partial automation tools as well. And then the bottom bullet there talks about uh, fleet management, uh, how you deal with routing the trucks. Um, there was the question about geofencing. So uh, Jen defined it very well. I'd, I'd like to even go further where if you consider geofencing to be dynamic, dynamic in the sense of not only are you uh, changing conditions based on a spatial region, you can do it by time as well. So you can have periods of the day that says, let's not have trucks do these certain activities, but maybe on a different time of the day you can. So there's a schedule issue as well as a, a geographical issue. And so these geofencing tools can be very useful when you have that connectivity to the trucks. Uh, this is a, a, a complex slide, but mainly to, to say that we're at the point with the medium and heavy duty vehicle electrification. It's coming along and it's coming along slowly, right? So we are, we are gonna electrify, but there are some major hurdles that we have to overcome in terms of how do we charge these vehicles? 
And the key takeaway here is that you can't just simply take a diesel truck and do a one-to-one -one swap out with an electric and, and think that it's gonna work okay. You have range issues, you have scheduling issues and all sorts of other things that come with that. So a lot of the research we've done with this project and other projects is figure out what is the best way to manage fleets of battery electric, uh, light, uh, medium and heavy duty vehicles. And so uh, you can see some of the projects working with Volvo and some of the local pilot projects that have been deployed here in Southern California. One of the other things that we've done a lot of work in is how do we route fleets of vehicles? And, uh, you know, when you think of routing, you know, you can always choose the, the least distance path or the least amount of time path. But some of the tools that we developed are how do we route trucks so that they expose the least amount of residents to their, to their exhaust, right? So we call this low exposure routing. And that was one of the tools that we really wanted to focus in on for this particular project. All right, so here's, here's our map. And as I said, this is just a small subset here in inland Southern California, but it's the city of San Bernardino. And you can see that it's focused in uh, around uh, the San Bernardino airport, which is now becoming a major air cargo hub, not just for Amazon, but UPS and FedEx and, and others. And it's surrounded by four of these freeways that you can see in the picture. And so as you can imagine, as you have warehouses throughout this community and outside this community, there's a lot of traffic, truck traffic that comes in and out, getting to that air cargo hub and then bringing things away from that hub as well. So the, the key thing is because this is encircled by uh, highways, the question is how do those trucks get from those highways into this center area? And there's arterial roads, there's residential roads, and, and uh, a lot of different activity. And so that's what we really focused in on. We modeled that uh, to the best of our ability. We did truck counts. We did all sorts of truck movements to understand what is the current scenario. And we modeled that. Then we went further and said, okay, where are the residents? What's the population density? Where are the hospitals? Where are the schools and all that? And so we made it even more complex with this, where we started to identify where is the highest degree of sensitivity, where is the population density the highest. And then from that, we uh, then employed air, disper air dispersion modeling tools to the point where we could get down on a link by link basis throughout the community, what the potential exposure risk was if you have trucks going down those roads. And so you can see that with the different colors here. We have you know, the red, which is obviously bad, uh, the oranges and yellows maybe slightly better. And what this does now is that you can take your routing algorithms and basically say, what is the best way to move from these freeways into this local air cargo hub and then back out? And so if all the trucks are saying, let's try to get there in the least amount of time, that it might not be optimal in terms of what you're doing for the residents, right? So there are many different uh, cases where trucks are cutting through neighborhoods and going down residential streets, mainly to shave off a few minutes or, or to get there, uh, simply accounting for congestion that occurs on other roads in, in the entire uh, network. So we, we looked at all these different alternatives, we calibrated our model, and we really try to understand what are all the different possibilities of the routes. And while we do that, we're comparing how much further do they have to drive? How much longer does it take? But then we're measuring how much less inhalation of air pollutants do the residents have when you do this type of routing? All sorts of data on this, and we have a, a couple papers out on this, but look, look at the key thing on the bottom. So in general, for this study, we found that we can achieve 10 to 40% reduction on pollutant exposure to the community, um, but it comes at a cost. You're basically asking these fleets to increase their travel distance, maybe from three to 5% and a travel time hit of around 10, maybe 20%. Um, there is a fuel economy savings too. So that could be a potential incentive for the fleets to save fuel. So the key thing is, you know, it's a balance, right? So how can we potentially ask uh, fleet management and, and fleets in general to basically consider these low exposure routes compared to routes where they're trying to, you know, make as best possible time and, and improve their uh, productivity as much as they can. And 
you know, there's, it, it's even more complex because you can uh, get traffic lights into the mix. And there's other ways, again, back to that connectivity and automation to smooth traffic flows along arterials if the trucks are listening to the traffic lights. And so that's sort of a separate study of some of the work that we've done. But the, the general conclusion is the same, is that you can have pretty significant reduction on, on the local exposure uh, by doing these routing techniques. So we, we've had a lot of discussions with our community partners uh, and we presented this information and, and we had these listening ses sessions that basically said, yeah, this is good. But again, it's not just about uh, the trucks uh, exposing people as they cut through our residential roads. It's exactly what Jen said. There's a safety issue. People are concerned about their kids out on the streets and having the trucks come down the roads and, and dealing with that. Um, we got a lot of complaints about uh, noise, right? Because these uh, trucks have schedules, right? They have to make these certain times where they have to get to the airport. And so that those are different times of the day, sometimes at night. And so noise was a big complaint. Um, and then the congestion that comes with the truck traffic. So we had a lot of feedback from that and, and really reinforced about, you know, can we route these truck fleets differently so that there is less of these uh, potential uh, impacts on our residents? Another uh, tool that we used was a mapping tool. And so this was a, uh, a mapping tool where it was a website where uh, the residents were asked, hey, if you knew of a particular problem, like there was a, a high congestion at this time of day or a, a crash or some kind of safety risk, we asked them to go to the story map and enter in that information. And over time, you know, the, the, it's sort of like crowdsourcing where it starts to fill out where people entered in where they thought the biggest problems were in the area. And then that allowed us to kind of, again, figure out what is the direct feedback from the community where the actual problems are occurring. So this website is still live and we're still collecting information here and it's providing a lot of insight to what's happening in the area. So then the question is, what do we do about it, right? So there's two ways. One is we can go and, and we have talked to the city of San Bernardino and, and others around about, you know, can we designate particular arterial roads about what is restricted for truck traffic and what is not. And so, you know, there are some uh, things that we can do, um, but that's more or less permanent, right? That's putting up signs that say, don't drive through this neighborhood, please take this other arterial road. But, uh, uh, and, and so some of this is happening. I know here in the city of Riverside, we redesignated a few of our arterials to have truck traffic go a different direction um, uh, throughout the day. Um, the other way is to, uh, you know, talking to the South Coast Air Quality Management District that has indirect source rules. So one idea would be to use these routing algorithms as another potential tool that warehouse operators can apply to their fleets. Right now, they can do a number of things to mitigate uh, based on this indirect source rule, but we, we would like to add some of these things that we've uh, used as part of that list of what uh, warehouses can do to mitigate. Then the question is, we, we went to talk to industry, we talked to Amazon, we talked to these different uh, fleets and said, you know, how likely is it that you guys would want to employ these type of techniques? And, you know, it's not easy, right? It's not like you can go in and say, hey, we're going to uh, cut down on your productivity because we have such a, a big problem with the, with the truck traffic. But we did get a little movement with Amazon. And so um, at least to the point where they're willing to do a, a small pilot where we can try this with a few of their trucks to see how well uh, uh, this would potentially work. And so um, we're still in discussions with that and we haven't done that pilot yet, but uh, really what this has led to is, is a new in initiative that sort of spawned off of this project, which, what we're calling OMEGA. So OMEGA stands for Objective Measurement, Monitoring and Mitigation of Emissions for Goods Movement and its Impact on Air Quality. And so this is uh, being supported by a grant from the Attorney General's Office, uh, their Automobile Emissions Research and Technology Fund. And the goal, again, is to be more comprehensive, to do a larger scale modeling of all the warehousing in the area, uh, better define our tools, such as electrification, such as the routing techniques, such as the fleet management, and then uh, uh, reaching out to the community and making this a longer term program, essentially carrying on what we've started with the SGC project and then making it more impactful over time. 
So a few things that we're, we're looking at, uh, uh, we're instrumenting a few of the trucks, we're gonna do some of the routing uh, piloting, as I mentioned, and then it also involves doing local air quality monitoring with these uh, low cost air quality monitors. So this is what uh, we're gonna be doing for the next couple of years. Uh, in the region. So this just got kicked off and uh, we're hoping to continue this and, and make some good progress. So I think that's where we are uh, in terms of our project. Um, in terms of our Strategic Growth Council project, uh, a lot of it focused on the goods movement, but we did some shared mobility work as well in the city of Riverside, which is a, a different topic altogether. But I'll, I'll, I'll stop there and happy to answer any questions. Thank you so much, Matt and Jen. Um, and I think at this point, we can go ahead and move to questions um, from the audience and, and just ho hopefully open up the dialogue about our work here. 